All right, <laughs> we are in 1 Kings chapter 4 tonight. Hopefully we're going to go through 4 and 5, a little out of sorts. Had, had, had a big weekend, <laughs> so a lot of things going on, and today I was just absolutely wiped out, had jury duty, and was working on the study, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to take a little 15-minute nap, and I woke up a few hours later going, oh, okay, that's a little bit more than a 15-minute nap, so just my body is telling me, you are tired, <laughs> So, anyways, all right, let's find the study here. Okay, so let's go ahead and pray over the study, and then we'll get started. First Kings chapter 4. Dear God, just uh, bless this time. Again, even as G.J. prayed, Lord, that we would hear your word, and we know that it does not come back void. And so may we just understand the principles, Lord, and, and even the narrative, Lord, where we see good things and bad things in these people, and just how you respond in grace, Lord, by your principles. And and we do thank you, Lord, that you brought your perfect message through imperfect people, um, because that's who you have to deal with, uh, this side of heaven. And, and we just thank you that you can use people like David and like, like Solomon and others, Lord. And so just uh, may we be encouraged that you can also use us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go ahead and look at First Kings chapter 1. It says, So King Solomon was king over all of Israel. And these were his officials. I'm going to butcher these, okay? <laughs> Azariah, the son of Zadok, the priest, Eliorphrath, and the Ahijah, the sons of Sheba, scribes, Jehoshaphat, the son of Eliud, the recorder, Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, over the army, Zadok and Abathar, the priest, Azariah, the son of Nathan, over the officers, uh, Zabad, the son of Nathan, a priest and the king's friend, Ashahar, over the household, and adore Ram, the son of Abda, over the labor force. And Solomon had 12 governors over all Israel who provided food for the king and his household, and each one made provision for one month of the year. And so what we're getting is we're, we're just seeing a listing of Solomon's uh, leadership and the various people that would run the government of Solomon. And just a reminder, whenever you see anything, uh, that, that is anything substantial, you're going to see a lot of people involved in it. <laughs> so Solomon uh, picked certain people to cover over important parts and uh, certainly uh, the meals. <laughs> and so he, he had people specifically that were taking care of the meals as well. As we're we're going to see they're huge. Um, and their names are Ben-Hur in the mountains of Ephraim. Okay. Now, there's names. This Ben-Hur was not the guy that rode chariots and was once a slave. <laughs> and a movie was named after him. But it's always good to know history. And, and honestly, if, we're, if we were doing this on Sundays, we would take it a little bit slower and look at some of these names where we can know who they are. And some we do, and, and some they're just names that are mentioned, even though they are extremely important in their day. We don't know uh, too much more about them. And then after this, there are more names of all the people who helped Solomon run the country, and I'm not going to read these specifically. They're all the way uh, through verse 19. So let's look at verse 20 in, in, in chapter 4, and it says, Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand in the sea by multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. And so it's basically just saying God was really blessing this people. This people who started as a, a, an infertile couple, who weren't able to have a child, and they were promised a child, and then they had a miracle child in their old age. And then that grew through a, a couple generations later through the, the 12 sons and the 12 tribes uh, to, to a group of about 70 people. And that 70 people spent 430 years in Israel and grew to a people, it's estimated, to be about 2 million. And so God is blessing them. They ended up being slaves in the land, and they were very much persecuted, but God blessed them, and they kept on having children and children and more children. They spent 40 years in the wilderness, and they still entered the land as conquerors, still having around 2 million people at that time. They enter a hostile land after being out in the desert for 40 years, and they end up conquering this hostile land filled with walled cities. God truly, truly blessed them. They went through 400 years without having a king, without having a national strategy to, to, to protect their borders and their people, and God would consistently, through that 400 years, raise up leadership 
in order to rescue them from their enemies, but they remained tribes. They didn't remain a unified country. They remained tribes during this time, and, and not tribes that were always defensive with armies because their armies would disperse every time uh, they, they had a victory. They didn't have this standing army. And, and what happened? Well, God provided for them over that 400 plus years. We know this is a time of judges. And then after that time, they wanted a king and God gave them the king that they wanted. He wasn't a very good king spiritually, but, but God still blessed them. And for 40 years, they ruled under that king. And finally, they got the king that God wanted them to have, King David. And we've just finished looking at King David's life. And, and I mean, really, ultimately, you know, God did watch out over them. They had a huge foe during the, the, the first two kings, and, and that was the Philistines. And David had really brought great victories over them. And so God truly did bless them to this point. And now they're going to be entering into a time of peace we're going to see under Solomon. And so God is continuing to bless the people. And, and I just want you to note that, that we as Christians so often take pride in what we've become. I think it's good to go, man, I've really changed. <laughs> But I don't think it's good to take pride in what we've become as God has changed us. I think it's good to say, wow, it is so cool what God has done in my life. <laughs> but to be able to say, man, I've done some great things in my life. As we th see throughout the scriptures, when anybody takes credit for their own blessings, uh, they're normally in a place where they're getting ready to fail, right? So man on his own normally heads in directions of evil, and man with God uh, can, can greatly improve. And so God is blessing this people. And, and so often, you know, this has always been the Jews' problem, right? God blesses us, therefore we're better than everybody else. That's not the case. God blessed them because he chose a people that was going to bring forth a Messiah. And they were that people. They could be extra blessed had they actually followed God, and many of them didn't. In fact, it's believed that most of those that died in the wilderness during those 40 years didn't believe, and they may not be in heaven. And Hebrews would indicate this, you know. And so God blesses everybody. This side of heaven, everybody is blessed. You know why? The first time they sin, God doesn't damn them to hell, <laughs> right? And, and they're able to eat. They're able to laugh. They're able to enjoy food. They're able to have children and enjoy the laughter and friends and food and fellowship and, 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 and enjoy success in life. And, and be able to accomplish things, make decisions, and, and enjoy life. So, so God blesses everybody this side of heaven. But what God is looking for is a heart that says, yes, God, I want to try to walk after you. And, and that's where believers are. Believers say, there is a God. There has to be a God. And God, I want to be your child. And so in a sense, we're, we're extra blessed, but not because we're so awesome. It's because God leaves this open invitation for us to accept as sinners. And we get to accept that invitation. And so it's a very humbling thing, you know, to, to be a Christian, to, to realize, oh my gosh, God is showing favor on me. And, and, and that is incredible. And, and that's what should really drive us to share with other people because we should look at other people and you need to become a Christian so I can brag about you at church. That's not the reason we witness, right? The reason we witness is because we have this incredible thing and we care about other people and we want to give it away to them too to see what God might do in their lives. And, and, and it isn't always a physical manifestation of good, as most of us know, but it is a, an, an emotional and a spiritual manifestation of good. It is a giving of hope that lasts beyond this world. And so this world is hard, and we know that. And, and I don't expect God to make me a millionaire. I don't expect God to always give me good health. But you know what I do expect? I expect peace that surpasses understanding because God promises it. I, I expect hope in eternity. You know why? God promises it. And, and, and I expect to become a better person in character throughout my whole life. Why? Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it. Romans 8, 29, you know, for, God, for whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be what? Conformed into the image of his son, the character of Jesus Christ. 
And so these are the things that are my, my greatest blessings in my life, not that, that all of a sudden I'm rich or whatever, you know? And hey, many times things do improve once you become a, a believer, you know, you, you get healed relationships and, uh, very often, and, and all of a sudden you stop stealing from work or talking back behind people at work or whatever, and, you know, and so yeah, yeah, God does meet those needs, but ultimately it's that emotional and that, it's that spiritual well-being that God gives us. That, that matters so much. And, 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 and ultimately, it's a relationship with God and it's a relationship with people that is rebuilt because in the garden, that was destroyed. Our ability to relate to other people selflessly and our ability to, rate, to, to relate to God spiritually, these things were destroyed in the garden and these things were renewed this side of heaven. Um, and so God blessed Israel you know, my, my dad was a man that was very blessed. And my dad was a school teacher in East L.A. And uh, he raised six kids, and not all of us were always obedient. And my dad had, had uh, nine hernia surgeries. My dad had a bad back and had three or four back surgeries. Um, my dad had several nasal <laughs> surgeries, you know, which made his nose kind of look like a mess across his face, <laughs> you know. And, but my dad was blessed in this because he followed after God. And uh, my dad broke his neck the year he retired at 65. And um, he didn't die. He lived for 19 months after that. But during that 19 months, I believe we counted there was over 300 different people that came to visit him some from other countries and certainly from all over our country to come visit my dad because he had good relationships with all of his or w with anybody who would have a relationship with him he had good relationship he understood a good relationship with god and he understood that that should bring a good relationship with people and hundreds upon hundreds of people showed up at my dad's funeral and uh um it went for two and a half hours, and people weren't, still weren't ready to let him go. And, and, and it was a celebration of a life well lived. And it was based upon relationship. All six of his children adored him when he died. That's pretty rare today, you know. And, uh, and he had held his last grandbaby, and that was McKenna, my daughter, um, was his youngest grandchild. And uh, he got to see her. And so it was all based upon relationships. And you know what happened when he broke his neck? His relationships didn't go away. His relationship with God was as strong as ever. And his relationship with his family and his friends maybe even got stronger at that point in time. You know, and so we are a people most blessed. And God has restored these things in our life. You know, but it, it was his work, his effort, his ability on the cross, his filling us with his Holy Spirit, his change in our character that allows us to be radically blessed. We always need to remember that. Praise God. Because me left to my own, I ruin relationships. Me left to my own devices, you know, I wouldn't be close to God. I'd be separated from God. I'm just a, you know, a sinner and my sin separating me from God. It was God's work that has radically blessed me. And the same with Israel. And so whenever Israel started to think they were good enough themselves, they got in trouble. And just remember, whenever you start thinking you're good enough yourself, you're in trouble, right? And that's why someone who's very mature in the Lord, who's walked with God is super strong and everybody looks up to them, can reach out and turn around to somebody and humbly help someone who maybe is trying to get off drugs. That's why someone who's very strong in the Lord does not consider it a, a waste of their time to reach out to the prostitute that just got saved because it is an awesome use of their time to care for others that they see are just like them, just a, just a little bit further, you know, younger in their walk with the Lord. And, and that's how Christianity works. It's like in the world, guys, those people that own companies have a bunch of people serving them and they got all the money and, you know, whatever, and I'm going to live my life and you're just, you know, you get your paycheck, do your job. But it's not like that within Christianity, right? You know, I, I would say the, the, the most famous apostle would be Paul, right? Or Peter or John, obviously. But, but Paul is the one that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament and, and all. And, and you know what Paul called himself? He called himself a doulos. He called himself a voluntary, voluntary slave to God. He also considered him not the potentate, not the above one, not the one to be looked up to in the church. 
he called himself an under rower. You know what an under rower was? It was a slave on a ship that went to the lowest parts of the ship and they rowed the ship. No, they, they didn't get to see daylight. They were the ones many times chained. And he's saying, as a Christian, the principle that Jesus taught was if you want to be great in God's kingdom, what? You must be the servant of all. The name of Jesus is the highest name in heaven. Why? Because he humbled himself in the greatest way, became obedient even to the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. Right? He who seeks to gain life will lose his life, and he who seeks to lose his life for Christ's sake will therefore gain life. It is better to give than to receive. If you want to follow after me, you need to be waking up every day and saying, where's that cross? I want to carry it today. Whatever you have for me, Lord, I'm your servant. Here I am today. And guys, have you ever met any sold-out Christians that are miserable? I haven't. Have you ever met any sold-out Christians who go through trials better than anybody else you've ever met? Yep. All the time. That's normally how it rolls, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, and so... Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. Why? Because God blessed their socks off. Did they deserve it? Absolutely not. It's the mercy and the grace of God. What did they deserve? They deserved judgment. And God gave them absolute blessing. And so it says they were as numerous as the sand by the sea. Again, it doesn't mean, you know, the, the estimate is there are 10 to the 25th power grains of sand on our seas of our oceans <laughs> you know but but that doesn't mean that they're that numerous it just means god has radical radically blessed them now god had promised abraham remember it's abraham and his wife they got past their childbearing years by a couple decades before god blessed them with a child of promise but god had told him blessing i will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Prior to him having a baby, this is what the Lord is telling him, past the years of childbearing, Genesis 22. And so we're looking at God's blessings on the people. And again, we're going to see it's not specifically because of Solomon that God is blessing Israel. He's blessing them because he's a blessor. Right? A lot of people say, oh, man, what a cosmic killjoy. <laughs> you know, God, God doesn't want to bless me. You know, and, and uh, you know, if I become a Christian, I can't, I can't smoke dope, or at least can't smoke dope and feel good about it. <laughs> you know, and I can't sleep around, at least not sleep around and feel good about it. You know, but in all reality, what is dope doing to your lives? It's destroying your life. What God does is he changes us to the point where we, won't want, we don't want to be that. We don't want to have those things in our life. You know, people say, you can't. I look at them and I go, I can't. Paul says all things are permissible. The blessing is I don't want to anymore. I want, I, I want to seek righteousness instead of selfishness. And so God blesses the people. Verse 21, so Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt they brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life now you need to understand that David had set this up remember David was an incredible warrior Solomon was not <laughs> David grew up in the trenches David grew up a little shepherd boy took out you know Goliath David took out a bunch of Philistines his whole life he was a warrior right and he set this up. And what ended up happening was the nations around started to pay tribute to David. They would say, we're going to pay taxes. Just, just don't overwhelm us. Don't, don't conquer us, <laughs> right? And that means he reigned or ruled. They, they were subject to, uh, to Solomon as it, as it were. And so from the area of where we would say Iraq today, that's, that's a couple countries up from Israel today. Israel's small. It's like a large county in Texas, right? 
it's San Patricio County, basically, you know, <laughs> which is a pretty large county. But, but it's like the size of a county, all of its land mass that the Jews are actually possessing, not the West Bank and not Gaza. But if you, if you look at it, it's pretty small today. But they were all the way up a couple thousand miles north and a thousand miles south into Egypt. It was a huge area, and, and they had buffers on all sides. Now, the, the part that they actually ruled was what we know as Israel today and a little bit larger than that, where, where the tribes were. But, but the people paying tribute and in peace with Israel were all the way into Iraq and all the way down to Egypt on, the, on both the east and the west side of the Jordan River Valley. Verse 22, now Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour, 60 cores of meal, 10 fatted oxen, 20 oxen from the pastures, and 100 sheep besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fatted fowl. For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, from Tishbath even to Gaza, namely over all the kings on this side of the river. And he had peace on every side all around him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Again, peace and prosperity. Men were not gardening with a sword on one side, you know, and a rake on the other. Men were gardening in absolute peace. They had enough, and they were blessed. They were satisfied. Now, as we see this, it, it, God had promised blessings on Israel and extra blessings uh, when they obeyed. And, and they're living on the, the residue of David's obedience. After Solomon, the kingdom will be divided because of Solomon's disobedience. But Solomon is living on the residue of David's heart towards God. And so God is blessing them. And it is the greatest time of abundance. It is the greatest time of peace. It is the greatest area that they ever ruled but, you know, some see this very much as a, a, as a picture of what it will be like when Jesus Christ eventually rules and reigns over Israel physically after he comes back, right? It says in Micah 4, verse 1 through 4, it says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. That would be Moriah. And shall be exalted above all the hills, and people shall flow to it. Many nations will come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall be, go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between many peoples, and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. And so what this speaks of is a time yet future to us where Jesus Christ is going to come back and he will physically rule and reign over the earth for a thousand years. And not quite in the perfection of the Garden of Adam, or uh, where, where Adam and Eve were, the, the Garden of Eden, but very close to it, what God intended. Someone that dies at 200 years old during that time will seem a youth. Children will be able to play with lions and cobras and sheeps will frolic with, with, uh, with, with their... They're predators, you know. It's going to be this incredible, incredible time. And people will go to worship Jesus during that time in, in Israel. So it's kind of a micro picture. Even though it's a huge area that is, that is coming to this small nation and paying tribute, paying taxes to them, and also coming and sitting at the feet of Solomon, it's just a forerunner of how it will be when Jesus Christ rules and reigns. Many times, and we're going to talk about this because sometime this month I'm going to do a prophecy update. But, but one of the, the things that you can look up, and if you haven't looked this up before, you can look up millennial reign of Christ. 
And, and if you start looking that up and looking into it, you'll find a lot of scriptures that foretell of this time. And it's, a, it's an incredible time on earth before the new heaven and the new earth are, are created. The, 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 uh, the final capital of heaven is called the New Jerusalem. And, and a lot of people kind of have this mixed up because we always think, you know, that place with streets of gold. That, that, that place with pearl gates of one large pearl. The foundations are all these different precious stones with the names of the apostles written on them. And, and the center in that place is the throne of God. And there's rivers of life flowing throughout the city. And, and there's trees of life bearing different fruits in every season, you know. And, and, and we can freely eat and partake. And guys, this is like a huge condo complex for believers. This is the home base of the new heaven and the new earth. So this is the city, but there still is a lot more to explore beyond that, a perfect heaven and a perfect earth beyond that. That's the eternal place. But there is a place during in the scriptures, as you read the scriptures literally, that you find out there's a time of, of uh, ruling and reigning on the earth w- with a perfect ruler. And that's Jesus Christ himself. And so if there's disputes in nations, he's going to be able to judge between those nations. And people will come to sit at his feet just to hear his wisdom. Obviously, wouldn't you? <laughs> you know? And uh, so it's a beautiful time. But this is what we see. We see people from all around coming to Solomon to hear uh, the, uh, of the wisdom which he speaks over time. And so we will see this. And then it goes on in verse 26. It says, Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Now, it doesn't name the, um, the people mucking the stalls, but I think they're the unsung heroes of this reign. 40,000 stalls of horses. That's a lot of horses, right? But understand, this is one of those things we read about that sets off warning bells for us. And, and, and one of the hard things for uh, Solomon is Solomon, you know, from the indications in the scriptures, it seems that Bathsheba was one of David's favorite wives, right? And, and, and therefore, he probably spent a lot more time with the children that he had from Bathsheba. And therefore, Solomon had a lot more of the character of David than some of his other sons, as we hear about the history of his sons, right? And uh, so... At the same time, Solomon was silver-spooned. Solomon had everything he wanted. He wasn't raised like David. And and so some of the things that he gets into, we can see that that he makes choices that are not the choices that he should have made. Why? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, it gives rules. When you have a king, Israel, this is 400 years, 500 years before they had a king, right? And uh, in Deuteronomy, it tells us what the rules are for having a king. It says, The king shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, You shall not return that way again. And it's even revealed in chapter 10 of First uh, Kings that Solomon gets many of his horses from Egypt itself. So he's not supposed to do that. And this is one of the things that Solomon does. Remember, a king in Israel was supposed to live like a pastor over the people as opposed to live like a king over the people, right? And, and, and so he is flaunting his wealth over the people. You need to understand that sometimes our bragging and showing off is actually an indictment to our disobedience, right? And as you get older as a Christian, sometimes you look back and the things you've said to people and the things you kind of bragged about, and you're like, oh, man, what a fool, <laughs> you know, because you just learn wisdom over, over time. You're like, oh, that wasn't a good thing. That wasn't a good thing to do. But uh, so it says that about him, but that's kind of like, ooh, that's not a good thing. Why? Because he's going directly against the word of God. But remember, God is still blessing him, and he's living off of the residue of the blessings of David. So, so a lot of times we kind of think, well, I had a bad day today. God won't bless me. I had a good day today. God deserves to bless me. You know what? God will bless you because of the life of Jesus, not because of your life. And, and, and what your disobedience does, it just removes you from the place where the blessings already are in your life. Now, let, let, me, let me explain that again. There's blessings God wants to give you in your life, and they're already there waiting for you, 
But when you walk away from him, you're not getting the blessing. Whose fault is it? It's yours. It's not God. Is God withholding blessing? No, you've walked away from the blessing. Okay? And again, I always use a relationship with my mom, because when my mom was alive, you know, she was known nationwide, maybe worldwide, for making some of the best chocolate chip cookies ever. <laughs> Many of you know this if you've been around our church and knew my mom. But my mom would always want to give me chocolate chip cookies. And when I visited her in California, her, her, she always wanted to have the timing that they were just freshly out of the oven and still gooey. Like, oh, yeah, right? And uh, I could choose to have a good relationship with my mom or not. She always wanted to give me chocolate chip cookies. But I, I could choose to never talk to my mom and never visit my mom. Therefore, what don't I get? Chocolate chip cookies. God spiritually has chocolate chip cookies for you. Just saying, you know. <laughs> And if you choose to be away from him, you're not eating of the good fruit. When you're close with him, he does have the blessings there. He always wants to bless you. He doesn't bless you in the way that you tell him to bless you. He blesses you in the way that he knows are best for you, though, at the same time. Okay. Um, uh, verse uh, 27 goes on after the horses. It says, these governors, each man in his mouth provided food for the king for King Solomon and all those who came to King Solomon's table. There was no lack in their supply. And so it was suggested that since King Solomon had so many employees and so many people working for him and, and uh, so many wives and children and, and all this, that he had as many as four to 5,000 people at his table daily. Think about that. Isn't that wild? How much food was provided on a daily basis? It, it's just, it, it's beyond measure. Like, okay, so so I, we, we just uh, had a shindig for my daughter's wedding, you know, and I think about how much food was provided, you know, and then my family was in town, and, you know, my wife showed up with bags and bags of, of, of barbecue for my brother and his wife, because he's from California, and he loves Texas barbecue, right? And I, I look at her like, are you kidding? More food? You know, because the, the morning before, I had bought like 20 uh, breakfast, you know, bacon, egg, and cheese tacos for some guys that came over to my house, and I had about, you know, I don't know, six or eight of those left over, so I'd been, like, trying to eat them because I'm cheap. Don't let that food go to waste, right? <laughs> and then, you know, and then I'd come to the church on the day of the wedding, and then there's all this food still there, right, from uh, uh, just everybody getting ready for the wedding, and we had, like, eight extra people on each side, and everybody was there helping you know, so there's all this food there. Then eating all the food at the, um, at, the, uh, um, at the reception and then having cake afterwards and then having all the leftovers from the reception and, and having all, uh, not, you know, that was given out all over the place and we took a bunch of it home as well and having all that at home and having some of the cake at home and then the next day having barbecue with, m with my daughter and her husband and their family or going to uh, Snoopy's, you know, and then that night having more barbecue and having left over from that barbecue, you know, and it's just like, oh my gosh, you know, but King Solomon, it was a daily thing, radical barbecue every day. It was interesting because I saw kind of the, um, kind of the, the level at which this would take place. Uh, at one time we visited Istanbul, and Istanbul uh, was the, kind of the capital of the uh, of the Turks and and uh, the Turks ruled the world for 800 years, the, the Europe basically, and uh, they would have uh, three to five thousand people at dinner every night, and, and so you can go to the Sultan's palace, and, and and you could see like kitchen after kitchen after kitchen after kitchen after kitchen after kitchen, after kitchen after, you know, like this whole building it looked like a full on barn was a kitchen, you know, and they would feed this many people. It's just just an amazing undertaking. Verse 28, they also brought barley and straw to the proper place for the horses and steeds, each man according to his charge. And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he is wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezrahite, 
and Haman, Chahal, uh, Dar, uh, Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame was in all the surrounding regions. Now, remember that Solomon had asked for wisdom above all else, and God said, I will give you wisdom and, wisdom and blessing, okay? And we don't know who all these guys were, but uh, obviously they were legendary for their wisdom. Verse 32, he spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. And we don't have all of his proverbs, and we don't have all of his songs either. We have a few in the scriptures. Verse 33, also he spoke of trees from the cedar of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He also spoke of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. And so his wisdom was not just judicial, wi judicial wisdom. You know, his other types of wisdom that he had, God gave him insight into, you know, various science and, and uh, biology topics. Verse 34, and, and men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear of the wisdom of Solomon. And so we're going to see that this is a theme, that people would come from all over the lands to come visit Solomon. Now we're in chapter 5. It says, Now H uh, Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon because he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father. For Hiram had always loved David. And so Tyre is just to the north of Israel in the land of Lebanon today. You have Tyre and Sidon, and they were two city-states. They were just north of Israel in that day. And this man Hiram loved David, and he was the one that actually had built David's palace for him. Okay, Now, he hears that, that David has passed the kingdom on to his son Solomon, and so he sends his men down to go greet Sol Solomon and to have a good relationship with him. And so David had a good name and therefore left a good legacy for Solomon. Verse 2, Then Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, You know how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God? because of the wars which were fought against him on every side until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither, neither adversary nor evil occurrence. And so he says, my father was under attack all the time. And we certainly know this about David's life. He says, but God has given me rest or peace all around. Now, David, during his time of rest, he started to think, you know, the Ark of the Covenant's here, the, 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 um, the tabernacle's, you know, 20 miles away, and, and God needs a permanent place for his tabernacle and for us to worship him, right? And so he began to entertain the idea of building, building a temple. It says in 2 Samuel of David, chapter 7, now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house and the Lord had given him rest or peace from all his enemies all around that the king said to Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent of curtains. And initially we know the story that, that his prophet Nathan, his main, it seems like his main prophet, the main one to tell him if he's doing right or wrong before the Lord said to him, do, do all that's in your heart. Why not? But the Lord rebuked him and said, Nathan, no, go tell him he can't do it. Why? Because he's a man of blood. And, and, and even though there's many wars going on and, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of fighting to get to a point of peace, peace is worth it, and I want to be known as God of peace. And so I don't want you building um, me a temple because it would be known as a temple built by someone who was involved in much bloodshed. So David would later tell sto the story to Solomon in uh, Second Chronicles. David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, You have shed much blood and have made great wars. You shall not build a house for it at my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. So as a warrior, he wasn't allowed to do it. But Solomon, listen, Solomon's name actually means peace. Jerusalem means city of peace. And Solomon is related to the idea of peace, right? 
And, and so it, it is interesting because of all people who should build the temple, David was the most spiritual king that Israel ever had and a man after God's own heart. But the timing just wasn't right. And so even though he was a great man and he wanted to be obedient to the Lord and the Lord wanted an ark built, he didn't want, or a temple built, he didn't want a temple built right then, okay? And, and, and so it's interesting. As you grow as a Christian, at first you'll notice, man, you know, I, I got to get rid of this cussing thing, right? Because it's a pretty obvious thing, right? And, and maybe I should stop dealing drugs and, and taking drugs. That's a pretty obvious thing, you know? Maybe I should stop sleeping around. That's a pretty obvious thing. Maybe I should stop beating people up. Yeah, that's a pretty obvious thing, you know? <laughs> but what happens in your life is, is those things go away, and then what happens? Well, then, then we start to get into the, the smaller things like God's timing, right, and being patient. And so often we know, oh, this is the right thing to do, and that person's wrong, and I'm the one that's supposed to rebuke them. And sometimes God says, well, yeah, you might, but you just need to wait. Ooh, we hate that word, wait, right? Or whatever it is, you know, and, and then we start noticing there's, there's more things than just right and wrong. There's also God's timing and patience. Right, And there's even beyond that, there's our attitude in what we do. So many times we can do the right thing with the wrong attitude, can't we? <laughs> right? And that's the interesting thing about a Christian. You're never done. Right? It's like the Pillsbury, you know, Pillsbury Doughboy, like you poke him and he's done. No, you're not done. You're never completely cooked. There's always something God's going to work in your life. And so in, in this we learn that there's a timing issue, and David was not the one that was supposed to do it. We saw this even in Jesus' life. Remember, his brothers were saying, you got go to gotta go to Jerusalem. Show yourself, man. Big shot, right? And then David said, wait, it's not my time, right? And, and so uh, Jesus, I mean, Jesus said, I think I said David said, but Jesus said, it's not my time. And uh, so he, he waited, and then he went eventually on God's time, uh, not on his brother's time, okay? So Solomon proposes a temple, verse 5. And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, he shall be, build a house for my name. So Solomon is aware of the prophecies concerning the building of the temple about him. Okay, verse 6. Now therefore, command that they cut down cedars, for me from Lebanon, and my servants will be with your servants, and I will pay you wages for your servants according to whatever you say. For you know that there is none among us who has skill to cut timber like the Sidonians. Remember? Tyre and Sidon. And they had these hills where the trees were said to be, like if you measured them around, they'd be 40 feet around. Huge trees. They'd be able to hew huge beams out of these trees. And so Solomon doesn't ever really do anything halfway. If you're going to have a wife, let's have 700 of them kind of thing. <laughs> you know, I mean, he, he goes for it. If we're going to have a meal, we're going to have a feast, you know. And so he wants to build this temple. But I want you to note, he's talking to the people who were friends with his father. It could, like, in my mind, and, and this is something I've come up with over the years, as I've looked at these passages again and again, in my mind, the temple of Solomon is ultimately the temple of David. Because David put everything in place, even the relationships with the people that would provide the timber. He put that in place. And, and, and the national pride, as it were, the, the unity under God to where all these people would come together and, and, and work for decades to get this thing to be the most beautiful uh, temple uh, ever, ever created, right? And so he says to these people that were visiting him, Hey, this is what we'll do. We're going to have a business deal here, okay? Verse 7. So it was when Hiram, the guy that had sent his, his ambassadors, who had a good relationship with David, heard the words of Solomon, that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, for he has given David a wise son over this great people. Then Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have considered the message which you sent to me, and I will do all you desire concerning the cedar and the cypress logs. My servant shall bring them down from Lebanon to the sea. I will float them by rafts by sea to the place you indicate to me and will have them broken apart there, and then you can take them away. And you shall fulfill my desire by giving food for my household. And so this was an ingenious way. They'd float them down instead of trekking them down 
these huge, huge trees that he would be sending down. And then Solomon would repay by making sure that they had enough food. Remember, Solomon was very blessed by God, and the land was producing a ton of food during that time. Verse 10, Then Hiram gave Solomon cedar and cypress logs according to all his desire. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household and 20 cores of pressed oil. Uh, thus Solomon gave to Hiram year by year. So this 20,000 cores was about 120 bushels or 120,000 bushels of wheat. And uh, tw 11 cores of pressed oil were 120,000 gallons of oil. You know, so, so a lot of the basics were sent to him. Verse 12, So the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he had promised him, and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a great treaty together. So he knows about science. He knows about the courts. He knows about building and designing, organizing, delegating. Solomon truly was a man blessed with wisdom, right? In, in our economy, most of us can only know a certain amount about certain things, right? We've got to rely on specialists in other areas. He was given some radical wisdom, and not just, you know, wisdom about science and so forth, but very practical wisdom. And, and just for you to know, there's a lot of very smart people out there that aren't wise, right? So wisdom is the application of knowledge, it's not just gathering knowledge. And this is where I say, like, say, uh, in the church, pastors have wisdom about taking what they know about God and applying it to the practical day-to-day -day living of people's lives, right? And, and so, so professors <laughs> who teach in a classroom uh, don't necessarily have that type of wisdom. And this is why it's kind of scary. I, I, seminaries are okay, but I think seminaries are the best places for really solid Christians who are already have a really good foundation would go. Because a lot of times there's really wacky professors in seminaries because they can come up with all these ideas and they don't see how their ideas actually practically work out in people's lives, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, and so you, you see this happening again and again. And, uh, you know, so I really believe the church is, is the place where people learn practical wisdom. And so if you have an intern... He's going to learn how to counsel or how you counsel or how you handle day-to-day -day problems within the church and, and actually have wisdom or you have knowledge that's applied. Applied knowledge is wisdom. You know, here, here, here's some wisdom. You know, there's, there's a boy who went to court because he was being beaten by his parents. And then they put him in a foster home and then he was beaten by his foster parents and then they gave him to the grandparents and then he was beaten by the foster parents. And then they finally gave him to the Dallas Cowboys because they can't beat anybody. Ha, ha, wisdom. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Los Angeles, right? The Los Angeles area. So we have two football teams now. When I was a kid, we didn't have any. <laughs> so there's also the story of the, two, uh, of the young boy. And the mom said, put these in the hamper. And he looks at her, he's like, put these in the hamper. So, so he, he's holding the dirty clothes, and he looks, you know, and the mom goes, you know, w where all the dirty clothes go? In the hamper. And he goes, so he goes over to his dad's bed, and he throws them on his dad's side of the bed on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Application of wisdom there, or knowledge. This is where the dirty clothes go. Anyways, verse 13. <laughs> Then King Solomon raised up a labor force out of all Israel, and the labor force was 30,000 men. Now, understand, uh, some of these were people that volunteered as slaves from the nations around them. Okay? And slavery was very different under the Israelites. It was more like employment or indentured servants. The Romans were harsh on their slaves, and they treated them like possessions. Some were good with their slaves. Some were very harsh on their slaves, so on and so forth. But in Israel, they were not supposed to be evil to those that would volunteer. And a doulos is a volunteer slave. And so many times in that economy, it's not like our economy where you have social security or disability or whatever. You know, in those economies, many times you would sell yourself as a servant or you would say, I'm your full-time employee, right? And that's how they were treated in Israel and underneath the law. And so he had um, this workforce underneath him. Um, Verse 14 goes on. It says, And he sent them to Lebanon 10,000 a month in shifts. They were one month in Lebanon and two months at home. 
Adorium was in charge of the labor force. And so they were, they were rotated to get all the lumber out of Lebanon, Lebanon so on and so forth. And then they'd also work there in Jerusalem building the temple. Solomon had 70,000, this is verse 15, who carried burdens, and 80,000 who quarried stone in the mountains, besides 3,300 from the chiefs of Solomon's deputies who supervised the people who labored in the work. And the king commanded them to quarry large stones, costly stones, and huge stones to lay the foundation of the temple. So Solomon's builders, Hiram's builders, and the Gibeonites quarried them, and they prepared timber and stones to build the temple. And so they were building the temple, and for them it was where God dwells. It was there that they were to worship God, connect with God, hear from God, and it was a place where people would come and they would see the glory of God. And if you didn't know God, you would want to know God and you can convert to become Jewish at that time. Now understand, in the New Testament, after Jesus Christ died and rose again, he purified us. So now the Holy Spirit can dwell within us. So when they built the temple, they'd have to consecrate it with all these special ceremonies to make it a holy place where God could dwell. Jesus Christ consecrated you. And now the Holy Spirit can come and dwell in you. And so the temple was a place of worship. Are you a place of worship? The temple was a place where you hear from God. Are you listening to God in your life? Are you connecting with God in your life? Right? The, the temple was a place of sacrifice. Is your life a life of sacrifice to the Lord? But the temple was also a place where unbelievers would come to see the glory of God. Does your life glorify God? And so it was this, this temple, and, uh, and you get the idea. There's thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people working towards this one goal of glorifying God in this temple. Now, we go out and we see a tree, and it's just a tree. But that tree has to be worked in order to be put into a house. And certainly these beams and the hugeness, the, the largeness of everything and the quartz and everything that would be in the temple— and all the metal work and, and all the stone work that had to take place, it's, 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 it's wor it was worth it to Solomon to take rough trees and to take all this time and effort to make the trees fit into the temple so that the temple would be beautiful and glorifying to God. It was worth it to Solomon to put tens of thousands of men to go miles away from the temple area and make stones that were 15 feet deep and 40 feet long and then roll them bit by bit up into the Temple Mount so that they would fit in together perfectly. If you go to Israel with us, March 2020, <laughs> you'll be able to walk down and see the stones that this is talking about. And there was not a chisel heard on the Temple Mount. They would chisel these stones so that they would fit perfectly once they already reached the Temple Mount because that was a place where God would dwell. They wanted to honor God and not make it a construction zone. And so they would bring it on, and it would fit perfectly. A rock is just a rock until it's hewn, right? Until it's, it's cut. A lot of effort, a lot of time in putting this temple together. And again, I think this is an illustration for us, guys, because we build our temple, as it were, and we maintain our temple, right? Or do we? Remember, we're reminded in the New Testament that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. What are you doing with it? You know, are, are you taking care of it? Are you maintaining it? Are you making yourself a place where it's inviting to God and comfortable for him to dwell in, right? And, and, and so in that sense, that we are, uh, we need to see our lives as worth it to be a place to where we want God to be pleased to dwell in our lives. How do you build, how do you decorate, how do you keep the temple that God has given you? And so he talks about the stones and it being built on a firm foundation. And we are also to build our life on the firm foundation. Now, for us, we want to make sure that we take care of the important things first, right? What is important in our life? I think continually, and I have to do this in my life all the time as well, I have to set priorities, you know, in my life on what is most important. And so, you know, if I'm married, 
My relationship with God is first. My relationship with my wife is second. If I have children, my relationship with God is first, and then my children are above. You know, I, I have these standards that the, the Bible kind of lays out, but I got to make sure that that relationship with God is first, right? And, and, and so you got you to gotta be sure to set your priorities, and whatever those priorities that God has given you need to be set out very carefully. And then we need to remind ourselves what those priorities are. Guys, we, we, we tend to put other things that aren't as important in our life before the things of God, right? Hey, there's nothing wrong with watching football. But if you put football before God, there is a problem, right? You, you got things kind of mixed up. Or if you put your children before your spouse, you're going to mess up your marriage. If you put your children before God, your marriage is going to be messed up. You know, if you put your work before God, what happens? Work becomes your God, doesn't it? Right? So you got to do the important things first. There's an illustration um, given where, where uh, a professor brought this, this uh, bucket out, a clear bucket, and he put large stones in it. As he put large stones in it, he asked the people, is it full? And they go, oh, yeah, it's full. And then he brought out some gravel, and he goes, he goes, obviously it wasn't full. It could take more gravel. And they ask, well, is it full now? And they go, well, probably not. <laughs> and then he brings out sand, and then he pours the sand in there. And then he asks, is it full? And they go, no. And then he takes out water, and he pours the water into it. But what if he poured the water in first, the sand in second? Could he get any gravel in? He couldn't get any gravel in, right? And he certainly couldn't get the large stones in. And so we can have all the elements of our life in our life, but if not, they're not prioritized, they get left out, right? So if you don't put God in the morning first, what are you putting first? And then what happens with God is he's left out. He gets squeezed out, right? And, and so it's just uh, important to, to set these priorities. And, and, and one of the things that, that Solomon had wisdom at, he would just know, and, and he hired builders that would know when to bring the next thing in, right? You ever do things backwards? Like, like when you're learning how to like paint or when you're learning how to do certain things, there's, there's certain things you should do first when you're doing construction, right? You, you don't put the drywall in before you do the plumbing. Except for I would do something like that, <laughs> you know? And I would have to learn my lesson. And Guys, learn your lessons. As a young believer, learn your lessons and then stick to the priorities that you have, you know? I had, uh, you know, I, 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 we're empty nesters, and so, you know, I, I, I come in late because I stay late because people want to counsel in the evenings, and I had a counseling appointment in the evening, and my wife looked at me, though, and she says, we need to go on a date. You know what I did? I canceled my counseling appointment. What a horrible pastor. Okay, maybe, but I'd rather be a good husband before God than a good pastor. Why? Because my wife is a priority over pastor. Now, obviously, you know, we're both willing to sacrifice. But it just came a point where we were super busy preparing for the wedding and everything else. My wife looked at me and said, we need to go on a date. <laughs> you know, and we went on a date that night. And it was, just, it was just important. And it was like, I did not hesitate, right? Because there's priorities in my life, you know. Again, my children have sacrificed their whole life. And, and, and at the same time, my children are important to me, and they will always be. I, I always have that role as father. But my children have learned how to sacrifice, and so there's times when I say, okay, I'm going to go on this mission trip. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be home for two weeks, <laughs> or you know, I have to lead this trip, or I'm going on this conference, or whatever it is. And, and so, yeah, my children have totally learned to sacrifice, but I need to be so sensitive to the Lord that I know that, okay, this is a priority, and right now, this is definitely important, and we need to do this. You see how that works? And, and, and so Solomon was able to build the temple. And the thing is, the foundation stones you didn't even see. But what if the foundation stones were bad? The rest of it would not hold together. We as Christians come to church with smiles on our faces, and our home life is hell. Is that a good life? It looks good to Christians, but who's your blessor? Who's your Savior? Who's your eternal God? I would rather have you coming to church looking haggard and have your priorities straight at home than, than coming to church with your teeth gleaming 
and your best perfume on while your family's falling apart. You know, I, w- I would rather, you know, th- I'd rather see you haggard and not, <laughs> not ready <laughs> to impress everybody else if you're actually spending time with God. And, and guys, you need to understand, one, one of the things about our church is um, it, it's always been my heart because I, I grew up in a huge church. And as a kid, I felt like I could never admit my faults because it was like, we're never has heard a discouraging word, right? And I didn't want to have a church like that. And then I was on staff at a church that was huge. And there's nothing wrong with that. It was, it was just a huge church. But one of the things I saw is you had to like, go through levels of trying out for the worship team to, to the point where the worship team were basically they could all be professional singers and musicians. Nothing against our worship teams. But I'm just saying there was just a, the, this, this high level, you know, that, that was like it just excluded so many people who maybe had an incredible heart of worship and maybe even a better heart of worship than those that were leading worship, right? And and, and in our church, I just, you know, it's my heart to say, you know what, we're a bunch of volunteers wanting to serve God. How does God look at the heart? And, and, And for me, I lead worship sometimes. I want God to be pleased with my heart while I'm leading worship, right? More so than pleasing you, I have a priority to please God. And it's not that we want to be distracting either. We want to have a certain level of excellence. And that needs to be our attitude. But at the same time, the worship team's heart matters more to God than the note coming out of their mouth. And it matters that way for you as well. Because we can look all good on the outside and play the game. And when I was on this staff at the large church doing counseling, every so often there would be someone who would come in for counseling and I would look at them, and my guesstimation of their life is their life was perfect. And in all reality, I realized, oh my gosh, you're a mess. But what they were projecting was perfection. <laughs> and what they had is a mess. I'd rather see them project less perfection and deal with the reality of who they are before God. And so that foundation stone, what I'm getting at, is important. Trees need a good root system. But you never walk up to a tree and go, wow, that tree has a good root system. Right? You look at the branches, you look at the blossoms, you look at the fruit, if it's a fruit-bearing tree, and, and, and you look at the, the produce. But that produce cannot be there unless the root system is good. And that's what you don't see. If the root system's bad, nothing else really comes of it. And so just, just to understand those foundational stones, the way that you build your temple... Remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And and, and the picture is not this big old craggy rock sticking out of the water. The picture is of a man going, okay, I'm going to build my house here. I'm going to dig down and I'm going to find a firm foundation to plant my, my house on. The man next door to him says, hey, I'm just going to build this house. I'm going to build it quick without digging down and finding the foundation. Guys, sand is a great foundation until the water comes by. You guys realize that, right? Sand doesn't really settle. It doesn't crack your foundation until we have a hurricane. Sand is not good during a hurricane. (laughs) Sand is fine otherwise. And so when the trials of life come, the foundation falls. So what are we called to do? We're called to build those unseen things so that that which is seen stands firm. And those are our priorities. Those are the priorities that we need to set. And so David had set a foundation for Solomon, and Solomon's building on the foundation of David, but he's also building right. Um, And just know, in our lives, we're going to produce things that aren't necessarily good. But God loves us so much that he'll cut us back, and then he'll start rebuilding. Every so often, the lo- every so often in my life, God kind of cuts things back, and then I start moving forward with a better foundation or a better, a better source, as it were, because I've built some things on some, some bad foundations. It says in, in John 15, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit... He leaves alone. That's not what he says. He says every branch 
that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. And so for us, sometimes we, you know, God knows us. We start building on, uh, on bad things or we haven't taken care of our foundation and we have to step back. Every so often we have to go, you know, my devotional life needs to get rocking again. And, and my wife and I, we, we commit to pray together and then there's times when we don't pray together. We gotta go, oh, gotta go back to that. Gotta get back, gotta prune back because we're doing things without the energy to do it because we haven't been praying together. You know, and you, you always have to get back to those foundational things in order to progress well. And so we're called also to build the temple. Make sure you build it carefully. And it is worth it to have a good Bible. If the, if the nicest thing you have in your whole home is not your TV, it's your Bible, that's, that's okay, <laughs> right? It's, a, it's worth it to invest in a woman's retreat or a men's retreat or, or a conference or or it's worth it to invest time into the men's studies and the women's studies and Wednesday night and Sunday morning, whatever it is that God is calling, it's worth it to invest in your Christian life. It's worth it to be faithful to missionaries, to provide money for missionaries, or even go on mission trips and visit them. It is worth it because you're investing in the foundational stones that are going to make you strong. And the world might think you're nuts, right? If, if you tithe, if you give 10%, man, you think I could have a much nicer car. Well, in my life, I think, man, if I didn't tithe, I might not have any cars that run, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, because in God's economy, you can't outgive God, you know? And, and so these are the things we got to actually think about and prioritize. And so the foundation stones and, and, and the wood in the building was made by the best craftsmen. And then it was plastered over. Or it was buried, you know, 40 feet underground, like if you go to Israel in 20... <laughs> 2020 you, you'll see that, that you don't see these things but they are the foundation let's go ahead and pray dear god we thank you for your word we thank you that we do have a sure foundation to build upon we thank you that you have given us a chief cornerstone that everything is built off of to square everything up that it's jesus and lord help us to build our our lives upon the rock and not just the easy way out upon the sand and thank you that you give us so many tools to do things right. Thank you that when we don't, Lord, you're there to do the construction, to, to, to rip out that wall, uh, to pull off the plaster and to help us rebuild it, that you prune us, that we may bear more fruit, God. And Lord, I just pray that everyone here would consider, especially at the beginning of the year, what the priorities are. I pray that the goals would not just be physical or losing weight and getting in shape, but the goals would also be spiritual that uh, their temples would be places that would be a great witness to those that don't know you, that they would come to see your glory in their lives and that they would want to know you, God. We love you, Lord. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.